Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. Merry Christmas, everybody, and thanks for listening this year. Today we're going to take a look back at what happened in music and audio and the music industry, not only in the last year, but the last decade as well. There were so many changes, and many were momentous. So let's look back at what happened in the decade of the 2010s first. It's been a decade of change. But the thing about it is, it went by so fast, or it seemed to go by so fast, that I don't think we realize exactly what happened and how much it changed our business. So let's just look at music technology, first of all. At the beginning of the decade, most classic engineers were still kind of skeptical about mixing in the box. Here we are at the end of the decade, and it's the norm. Nobody even cares anymore. Everyone sees it for what it is. No longer are engineers trying to duplicate the sound of a console. As a matter of fact, most newer engineers haven't even worked on a console. So a lot of those memories are actually aren't there to begin with. That being said, we have much better plugins. There are better models, and a lot of that is because there is a realization by plugin developers that noise and hum are actually part of the analog sound. And once they modeled that and put it in some of the plug-in emulations, they sounded closer to what everyone is used to. So we have much better plug-ins, but on the other side, even the plug-ins that are not trying to be emulations of analog devices, even they're better in so many ways. And then going another step, intelligent plug-ins are now pretty much the norm. Now plugins will do a lot of things that engineers used to do manually, and although that may scare some of the classic engineers to some degree and make you think that there might be some (laughs) built-in job obsolescence there, what it does, in fact, is it makes everything faster. And believe me, I think just about everybody will agree, if you could do the job faster, then everyone is better off for it. So uh, welcome to Intelligent Plugins. Consoles have also made a comeback. There was a point in the decade that it began to look like consoles were going away completely. And now we find there's a resurgence where they may be smaller than they used to be, but consoles are something that most studios have. And in fact, most console manufacturers are still doing really well, and in many cases are even having a difficult time keeping up with the demand. One thing that's really, really changed, and this is both in the studio and live, is that amplifier emulations have gotten so much better, and so much better to the point where now we see big bands that are touring without amplifiers. They're just using emulators. The one that kind of surprised me the most was Metallica, because you expect them to have marshals or boogies or whatever, and in fact, no more. Now we're seeing that The amp emulators are so good that just like mixing in the box, same idea, there are so many advantages that it's hard to say no. Advantages being it's the same sound every night. You don't have to worry about tubes breaking. You don't have to worry about the fragility of tubes, things like that. So now we're seeing that the amplifier market is actually down quite a bit, even for club players where the tastes of the average guitar and bass player have changed tremendously just in the last decade. Another thing we're seeing is the power of the computer and the digital audio workstation has changed the way everybody works. Now, of course, there's so much power in the typical computer that we no longer have to worry about track count and plug-in count, things like that, for the most part. Now, when you get huge, huge projects, you may run into the ceiling on what your computer can actually handle. But for the most part, that's no longer the case like it used to be. Most DAWs have tremendous power, and they're somewhat equal, where at the beginning of the decade, Pro Tools ruled, especially in Pro situations. Now, it's still pretty much the same, especially in Post, where Pro Tools is the only way to go, but now we find all the alternatives, and there's plenty of them, that are really, really good, very comparable, and for the most part, if you don't have to worry about working in a Pro situation where Pro Tools is really important, then there's no reason to actually go to it. So this has changed a lot in the last decade. 
Now, if we go on the business side, what we find is streaming has really taken over the decade. At the beginning of the decade, streaming was available, but no one had any idea. And as a matter of fact, there was a lot of skeptics that thought that it would never take off and it would never bring the music business back to what it was. In fact, that's all changed. The music business has been doing really well the last few years, and it's all based upon streaming. Spotify has been the big dog in the industry, the streaming industry. And at the beginning of the decade, I don't think anybody would have predicted that, even though it seemed to be in front at the time. Something that's more recent is the fact that Amazon has come on very strong with Amazon Music. And no one would have predicted that at the beginning of the decade because there was no such thing as Amazon Music at the time. One of the reasons why Amazon Music became as big as it is today is because of Alexa and voice activation. Smart speakers, in fact, weren't around at the beginning of the decade. And around 2018, everyone thought that was the next big thing. 2019, I think, has proven that they're not going to be as big as everybody thinks, mostly because they're used for primarily music. So you're going to ask Alexa, you're going to ask Siri to play you a particular song, and maybe you're going to ask them for the weather, but not so much for anything else. At least that's what the studies are telling us. As far as a smart home is concerned, again, this is one of those things that everyone thought it was going to be the next big thing. But now there's a lot of suspicion about it, especially when it comes to privacy issues. So we're not seeing the uptake like we thought on the smart home, the smart speakers, etc. That being said, Amazon Music has benefited greatly from Alexa and voice activation. And in fact, that's what's pushed this music service. A big thing for artists, at least major artists, in the middle of the decade was exclusive releases. So in other words, a new release that can only be found on Tidal or Apple Music or Spotify. These sort of backfired because real fans would say, I'm not going to go over there to a service that I'm not paying for and then pay for it just so I can get this release. So it didn't actually work the way anyone thought. And after a short period of time, I'd say nine months to 12 months, that sort of went away. So exclusive releases aren't like they used to be. You still might see them occasionally, but it's not like the next big thing, like everyone thought way back in 2016. Crowdfunding turned into something for music that was a real big thing for a while, especially with pledge music. And then with pledge music having financial troubles and going out of business and having so many artists actually have their campaigns struck down in the middle without being able to pay back their followers or deliver on their promises, it's really stuck an arrow in the heart of the whole crowdfunding movement. Another thing that's really changed is the loudness wars. Now, of course, this stems from the fact that most artists and producers tried to make their songs as loud as possible. And back in the radio days, you wanted it to really jump across the radio and sound louder than the song either before it or after it. That's all changed. Now that streaming services do all the encoding and then normalize the loudness, you no longer gain a lot by having the loudest record in the bunch. So even though the loudness wars aren't going away, they've been somewhat tamed, which is a good thing. This has happened more in the last couple of years than in the beginning of the decade, but it's something that's pretty welcome, especially to mastering engineers everywhere. Another big change in the decade was digital rights management. In other words, copy protection, which was a big deal on files that you downloaded. Record labels went back and forth whether to use it or not, eventually decided not to, but it became a moot point when file sharing died. And why should you share your files when, in fact, you could get it for free on a streaming network? The other thing that died with that was piracy. Now, it went to the point where, just this last year, iTunes was discontinued, something that would have been outrageous speculation at the beginning of the decade. No one would ever have predicted that to happen. There's been a big rise in electronic music, and I think this peaked about three years ago, where it seemed like everything that you read, everything that you heard was based on electronic music. Now, electronic music 
still influences what we listen to today, especially if you listen to pop music. It's everywhere. Songs are based on loops, more so than real players playing. But that being said, you don't hear as much. It's kind of plateaued. Talking about electronic music, it's kind of plateaued. And if anything, it's sort of fallen out of favor in the last year or so, except if you're really into that niche. Now, now all that said, rock has really fallen on disfavor during the decade. There are fewer rock releases. There's just not as much buzz around rock, even though it's still there and the fans that love it still love it and they're not going away. But it's certainly not as prominent as it was at the beginning of the decade. This has been the decade of the female artist in pop. And if you go back and you listen to all the hit makers during the decade, most of them are female. Again, on the pop side, Adele, Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, Miley Cyrus, Billie Eilish, just to name a few. If a pop artist gets hot, chances are it's going to be female. This is also the decade for slick country music. This has been coming on for quite a while, but country music has become sort of what California rock was in the 70s and 80s. It's very slick. It's very well produced and put together. Country artists, of course, kind of peaked, I think, about three years ago. Now you still have country that's big, not quite as big as it was, but you have worldwide hits with country music that was kind of unthought of not that long ago. Latin music as well has really come on strong in the decade, especially reggaeton, which has kind of taken over on the Latin side. Now we're finding that many Latin artists actually have big U.S. followings from people that don't actually speak Spanish. That's a step in the right direction, I think. Likewise, you have the same thing with K-pop, yeah, Korean pop, where you have bands like BTS that have huge international followings, again, from fans that don't speak Korean, don't much care about it, but love the whole boy band thing or girl band thing. One of the things that I've seen that I think is a big deal is the fact that each country now has its indigenous pop music. Once upon a time, if you would go to any country in the world, you would hear mostly hits in English from the U.S. and the U.K. Whatever was popular in the U.S. or the U.K., that's what you'd be hearing. So if you go to Singapore, you go to Tokyo, that's no longer the case. What you now hear is a version of Western music, but sung in the native language, mostly hip-hop, because hip-hop is very easy to reproduce, and you no longer hear the big hits of the United States in many countries of the world. So that's a big change. So now let's look back at 2019, because there were a lot of significant happenings there as well. Last year showed us that virtual reality isn't going to catch on. I think we saw in 2017 and 2018 that there was a lot of momentum going that way. There was a lot of excitement, but nothing ever caught the public's imagination, mostly because there wasn't a product that was compelling and easy to use as well. Now, augmented reality is a different story. There's actually been quite a lot happening in that area, and it looks like it does have a future. Now, that being said, not much happened in 2019 to push that forward, at least not in front of the public. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, but not that much that we saw ourselves. Now, when it comes to audio, it's been a very interesting year. In terms of plugins, I thought there were a couple that were really fantastic that came out. One was the Abbey Road Studio 3 plugin for headphones by Waves. And really, that makes a huge difference because I think for the first time, it's really possible that you can actually mix on headphones and feel comfortable about what the outcome might be. The other was the Capital Chambers emulation from Universal Audio. That was pretty cool because the Capital Chambers are kind of like the pinnacle when it comes to what reverb should sound like. And to have something that even gets close, I think, is pretty significant. These things are so good that they just sound great without any manipulation at all. So those two plugins really made a big difference, I think, at least from the way I work. This was also a big year for immersive audio. Now, of course, we had it before when it came to games, but now it's finally coming out to the public, mostly in the case of Dolby Atmos, although in a live situation, 
with the L Acoustics Elisa system as well. But the Dolby Atmos, first of all, really does make a difference in music. Now, I think the big thing here is, how does it get out to the public? Well, also in the last year, there was an announcement that Amazon's new HD tier was actually going to be able to stream Dolby Atmos. And Dolby went and they made deals with both Universal Audio and Warner Music in order to get content. Now, you might think, well, that's two out of the three majors. Where is Sony? Well, Sony, as usual, has their own system. It's called Sony 360 Reality Audio. Haven't heard a whole lot of that past CES last year. CES made a big splash, but we haven't heard too much since then. Unfortunately, we have a VHS versus beta situation one more time. Already that's getting old because most people don't remember (laughs) or weren't even alive when that happened, but essentially we have two competing formats. That's never really great for business, but we'll see if this even catches on. One of the things that is going to be required is there's going to have to be some home hardware that will have to be easy to use and wife approved. So if that happens, and we won't know until CES, then I'll give both of these formats a chance. Now in the live scene, like I mentioned before, Eliza is making a lot of headway. And it's one of those things that it really does push concert sound forward by a great deal. Now you always hear concert sound in mono for the most part, The reason why, as soon as it goes into stereo, then half the audience can't hear what's going on. And really, there's only a small sweet spot in the middle. With Eliza, though, the way they have it set up, 95% of the audience can hear a difference and can hear new spatial elements. So that's why that's exciting. And I think the biggest proponent of that would be Aerosmith in their Las Vegas residency. Now, of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence is really making a lot of headway in all sorts of different areas, but it's also in music, quite a lot, actually, and we're starting to see AI artists. Not starting, they're actually here, especially like on Spotify charts, but not the big charts, not the pop charts, not the rap charts, none of those. We're seeing it more on the down market charts like Chill and The reason why it's very easy for AI to create music that works in that environment. I think the big problem this year was the fact that Spotify commissioned some companies to do this, bought the rights, and then created fake artists in order to make more money. Nobody says that's not legal. Is it fair? Don't think so. So another thing to look out for is who's really the artist and the publisher when it comes to something that's created by artificial intelligence. I think we're starting to see that the programmers are beginning to actually get compensated for what they do with royalties, so they become the artists. Will that become an industry standard? Who knows? I think we'll see more happening in that in the next year. Staying in audio for a second, one of the things that really struck home to me was the fact that Fender just came out with a couple of modeling amplifiers that look exactly like a Blackface Twin in Deluxe. Now, if you're going to pick two amplifiers from Fender that you would say were iconic, you'd pick the Twin Reverb and the Deluxe Reverb, for sure. They're different circuits, they sound different, they are sort of the pinnacles of the line. And now they've come out with modeling amps that look the same, and you wouldn't know the difference. I haven't heard them live myself, but I've heard the demos, at least on YouTube and a couple other places, and boy, they sounded really close. This is a big change, and like I said before, we're starting to see a whole generation of players that don't much care for classic amplifiers, don't care if it's modeled or if it's the real thing, and actually would prefer the modeling. So that's really changing, and I think the fact the Fender came out with these is significant in that it kind of shows us that the future is here, whether we want it to be or not. On the business side of things, both Avid and Guitar Center are doing a lot better. Now, of course, it didn't look good for either of those companies in 2018. But in 2019, while the future doesn't look exactly rosy, it doesn't look as dire as it did before either. Avid stock has stabilized. It's about half of what it was at its peak, but it's still doing okay. Guitar Center, everybody thought was on the brink, but in fact, they seem to be doing okay as well. And if you watch TV at all, you'll see that there were a lot of Christmas ads this year for Guitar Center. 
that indicates at least they have money for marketing. In talking to many of the manufacturers that I'm friends with, they all tell me that they're doing fine with Guitar Center and everything seems to be stabilized. Now, speaking of selling gear, Reverb.com has become the go-to place to sell your gear online. And the company was acquired this year by Esty. Esty, of course, is another place where you can sell stuff online. So Reverb.com kind of fit right in. There hasn't been any changes so far. There's not any changes that are predicted. And we'll see. You always get a little tense when a company is doing really well and all of a sudden it's purchased and its founder is no longer there, which is the case here, but time will tell. Also, staying in the audio portion of things, this year we saw MIDI 2.0 come out. Now, it's not earth-shattering. Basically, it just adds a lot more features. It's faster. But people might say that, well, you know, maybe this is 10 years too late, five years too late. MIDI is still in use, but the fact of the matter is it's not used the way it used to be. You don't have the huge MIDI setups that you once had. Keyboard players aren't as dependent upon it as they used to be. But that being said, it is the backbone for keyboard interconnections, keyboard to computer, keyboard to drum machine, all that stuff. And MIDI 2.0, I don't know if it's going to be earth shattering, but it definitely helps. One of the interesting things that happened this year was Universal Music bought the House of Blues Studios in Nashville. That's a pretty big complex, and it's now owned by Universal Music, and everybody kind of scratched their head and thought, why would they do that? Well, mostly because of this Dolby Atmos thing, like I said before. They immediately put in a couple of Atmos rooms and got to mixing. And what we've heard is all of the Universal Studios around the world have been going 24-7 since probably about April, May, trying to crank out product for Dolby Atmos. Here's something that I don't think is a great development. What we saw last year is the average hit had 9.1 songwriters attached to it. Now think about that, 9.1. A lot of that is cover your ass in that if you're in the room while a song is being created, you automatically get credit as a writer. That's so someone doesn't come back later and sue you for writer's credit, which continues to happen anyway. You might think, though, that if you have nine creators on a song, it's kind of homogenized at that point. It used to be when you had one or two creators, at least it was focused, the vision was focused. And now that might be the reason why a lot of pop music is kind of plain vanilla these days. Now, speaking of hit songs, it was really apparent in the last year that online content and especially music really changed. And when we think about songs, for instance, the forms have changed. Songs are really short, and we're seeing a lot of hits that are around two minutes or a little less. Thought behind it is, with streaming, you'd rather someone stream it three times because you get paid three times. Rather than having one four- or five-minute song, you only get paid once. So that's changed song forms a lot. We've also seen things like videos get shorter, mostly because the attention span of the average viewer is much shorter these days. So now we're looking at Short attention span theater, if anybody remembers that. We were talking about stock before. Spotify, of course, is a really big entity in the music business as a distributor. Its stock has pretty much stabilized. Again, it went down uh, about 20 or 25% from when it was first put on the market, but it's been pretty stable, especially lately. So everyone that thought that that would tank, they're wrong. It may not be doing great, but it's not doing that badly either. Speaking of writer's credit and plagiarism, there's a lot going on when it comes to that. Katy Perry, for instance, had someone sue her over her big hit Dark Horse, claiming that it was plagiarized. But she's fighting back. Many times what will happen is an artist will just say, well, let's settle because it's a whole lot easier. Not the case here. And in another case, that's happening as well. That's with Lizzo and her really big hit, Truth Hurts. In one case, there was someone that asked for credit because of a tweet that's included in the song. She was given credit without a problem, but there are two brothers that are saying there was a line in the song that they wrote in another song and she copied. And Lizzo is saying, no, that's not the case. So we're seeing this whole thing happening here where plagiarism is becoming such a big deal that artists and writers are very gun-shy 
and would rather settle or give credit, except if you have a big hit. If you have a big hit, you can take it to court and actually see if it will work in your favor, although it hasn't in most cases, but we'll see what happens here. Now, speaking of Truth Hurts, there were two songs that became huge hits this year in the United States that were strictly because of TikTok. Yes, TikTok became a really big deal this year. And one of the things about it is it was really big when it comes to music. And the memes that showed up for Truth Hurts and also for Old Town Road, yeah, Lil Nas X, who had a huge hit for most of the year, those got kicked off on TikTok. So now there's a lot of competitors that are springing up saying, hey, we're the TikTok of the UK, we're the TikTok of the US, or we're going to overtake TikTok, and there's tons of money that's being spent on this. I, for one, think that TikTok is a social flash in the pan. Come back in three years and see if it's around or if it has the same influence. Bet it won't. The Universal Vault Fire was really a big deal this year. It happened 10 years ago, but for some reason it got kicked back in the news. And the reason why was there was never a full accounting of exactly what was lost. So there was a huge fire that happened. It was on the Universal lot. And it was a lot of their archives, and especially their music archives. And just about any major artist lost something in the fire. Now, that being said, Universal says, oh, wait, we have copies. Some of what was lost was a copy, was just a safety copy. But nobody really knows for sure. Now, to Universal's credit, they're trying to figure that out. But there's a lot of lawsuits going back and forth saying, wow, you lost some stuff that's irreplaceable. So we'll see how that one goes in the future. Band Lab, the very interesting company out of Singapore, which in 2018 purchased Sonar Cakewalk from Gibson and had also owned part of Rolling Stone magazine, bought UK's NME and Uncut. Now, NME, New Music Express, has, oh, for 50, 60 years been one of the key music magazines in the UK in terms of music press, in terms of music visibility. So now that's owned by BandLab. I think a really big thing that's coming down, this is a law that was passed this year but won't go into effect until January, is the California Indie Contractors Law. Basically, this was aimed at lifting Uber drivers who say they were being taken advantage of they were basically working full-time, but yet weren't being treated as employees. And it goes another step here because Apple contractors kind of said the same thing. They work on the Apple campus. They work there they're 40 hours a week and more, but yet they're still treated like independent contractors. So this law was passed in order to kind of equal everything out a little bit. That being said, it's really looking bad for the music industry as well because it kind of means that anybody that plays a gig can be classified as an employee so what everybody's thinking is that this is really going to affect music in California a lot, and in multiple ways, more, more ways than that. But so far, there hasn't been any amendments to the law, even though everyone is fairly aware of what the consequences might be. So look out for that one. The Music Licensing Collective really got in gear this year. That was a result of the Music Modernization Act, and... The MLC is a way for easy licensing and collection of mechanical royalties from streaming. And of course, there's no good way to do that, especially for licensing. Licensing is a real problem for television and movies in the fact that, again, if you have nine writers a song, it's really hard to track those publishers down. So this is an easy way to do that if you want to license a song, but it's not really in gear yet. But it got rolling this year, and for a while, no one thought that was going to happen. Along those lines, we had a ruling this year that the songwriter royalty should be increased for streaming. And in fact, what happened was Apple said, yes, okay, we'll do that. And all the other streaming networks appealed it. So that's kind of a drag. Along those lines, Netflix and Discovery went to their composers of the music for their TV shows, and said, okay, here are the new terms. From now on, you no longer get performance royalties. We take care of all this. Everything you do is basically a buyout. Now, composers used to be able to make a good living just on advances, and then they make a better living on the performance royalties whenever it was shown on television. And of course, over the last few years, those 
advances have gone down quite a bit with the understanding that, okay, we'll still make a good amount of money on the performance side with Discovery and Netflix saying, "Eh, we don't think we're going to do that anymore. That really makes it tough for composers. So again, this kind of just got sprung in everybody just this month, just a few weeks ago. So we'll see how that plays out. Coming back to Spotify, they did a deal with DistroKid. And the whole idea was, you know what? All you have to do is submit your music to Spotify and we'll get it out to all the other streaming services. Of course, using the infrastructure of DistroKid. Well, that went on for about a couple months and then very quietly, Spotify kind of forgot about the deal. And it turns out it's very labor intensive to do that because it's easy to get the music out. That's not the problem. The problem is collecting all the royalties and how you distribute them. So that turned into being a bigger deal than the people at Spotify anticipated. And now they're no longer a distributor. Actually, there was so much more that happened. I'll just go over a few more things here. Marshmallow did a huge concert on the video game. Fortnite, yeah, it was a big deal. And he reached more people than ever could in a concert. I think it was 6 million that tuned in. Look for that to happen more in the future. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Apple Music now has more U.S. subscribers than Spotify, and Amazon Music is coming on really strongly. Now, Amazon Music is mostly because of Alexa and Alexa devices. The voice activation is a really big thing. This all makes for a really interesting year. As you live day by day, you might realize some of these things are happening. But when you look back at the end of the year and look at the enormity of the number of things that have happened over the year, it really hits you and you think, boy, there's so much going on in this business than I ever thought. Now, with that in mind, just imagine what it's going to be like next year. What revolution is going to happen? I'm going to talk about that next week. Thanks so much for listening and being in my inner circle. I really do appreciate it. I'm really thankful for your support. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. To listen to the episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyowinnercircle.com or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, TuneIn Radio, Radio Public, and Podbean. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyowinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts to your new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bye.